Hello, everybody, and welcome to NYC Film Green's Office Hours. My name is Shira Gans, and I'm the Senior Executive Director of Policy and Programs at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. One of the things I get to do in my job is I direct our office's NYC Film Green. For those of you not familiar with the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment, we're the city agency that supports all the creative sectors in New York City. That's 500,000 jobs and $150 billion in economic activity. And we support the film and television industry in multiple ways, one of which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with is that we're the permitting agency in New York. But we also try to promote um, sustainable film production through our NYC Film Green program. And that program launched in 2017. It has um, three goals, I would say. The main three goals are to create a sustainable blueprint for production. So we have guidelines for that on our website. It's to provide recognition to productions that are engaging in sustainable practices and reducing their impact on the city and the environment, and then to provide free resources. And so we do that through um, webinars like this and other materials that we distribute in the community. So I'm really excited for tonight's discussion on sustainability on screen. I know it's a hot topic. We have a great panel uh, to take us through this topic. And so thank you again for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you at future office hours. All right. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of New York City Film Green Office Hours. I am Anna Laura and I am the Education and Special Programs Manager uh, at Earth Angel, a sustainable production consultancy helping to reduce the environmental impact of film and television production. Thank you all for joining us today to discuss sustainability on screen. Uh, please feel free to enter all of your questions in the chat, uh, and we will get to them during the Q&A portion of the panel. Um, all right, let's get started. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, I think so. Okay. <laughs> um, entertainment has a huge impact on culture, with, on, on culture with the power to influence and change consumer behaviors, knowledge, and attitudes. Television shows and films can spark many meaningful conversations with the potential to drive people into action for our environment. Mass media has a great potential to deliver an essential source of educational information to the public, improving the understanding of climate change and contributing to creating awareness and shaping favorable attitudes towards climate change. The Norman Lear Center's Media Impact Project conducted a research project uh, with support from Good Energy. Um, which aim to understand and measure the frequency of mentions of 36 keywords related to climate change in over 37,000 scripted TV episodes and films from 2016 to 2020. The results of this study were quite stark. Um, the, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, only 2.8% of all scripts included any climate related keywords and only 0.6% of scripted TV and films mentioned the specific term climate change. As part of the study, a survey of 2,000 people in the United States revealed that more than 75% of respondents learn about social issues from scripted entertainment, but only 25% hear concerns about the climate crisis from these sources, far less than other media sources. So climate change and the climate crisis is fast accelerating and will affect everyone either directly or indirectly. So why then is it not featured more prominently in television shows and films? Why does it seem like the characters in our favorite shows are ignorant to the issues affecting our climate? Despite some notable features, uh, mentions of the climate crisis are largely absent from video content currently being produced. So then how, how then can we address the issues surrounding climate change um, through the stories and content that we see on screen? To discuss these very important questions, we have a host of incredible panelists here today. We have Carmiel Banaski. Uh, Carmiel is an award-winning novelist and TV writer staffing on Amazon's Undone. Currently, she's creating a climate fiction audio drama for Wondery and adapting a feminist fantasy for TV. She recently co-wrote a film starring Margaret Cho. Um, she had the opportunity to explore the Arctic on a sailing vessel, studying and writing about climate change. Now, as head writer for Good Energy, she helps screenwriters integrate climate into any project with joy and humor. She's a film independent fellow and the author of the critically acclaimed novel, The Suicide of Claire Bishop. Other writing has appeared, among other places, in The Guardian, 
LA Review of Books and on NPR. She earned her MFA from Hunter College, uh, where she was also a professor of creative writing. As program director of the Redford Center, Heather, Cult Heather Phipps cultivates grants, resources, and community for environmental filmmakers and oversees impact-driven projects and campaigns. She co-founded the um, Hollywood Cl Climate Summit, an international conference and coalition of cross-sector climate storytellers supported by Netflix, Paramount, NBC Universal, Meta, and more. In her work as a creative producer, she's committed to stories that reframe the climate conversation as an opportunity to create a better world for all. She recently led the conversation, Audiences Want Climate Stories at Sundance. Sheila Mikhail Moravati is the president and founder of the nonprofit organization, um, Habits of Waste, which focuses on finding solutions to shift habits of waste among mass society. Known for many innovative campaigns, such as the Keto Cutlery campaign, uh, Sheila spearheaded the ban of plastic straws and cutlery in the city of Malibu, and then convinced Uber Eats, Postmates, DoorDash, and Grubhub to globally change the default setting in their applications so that no one receives plastic cutlery unless requested. Habits of Waste is running numerous campaigns, such as Lights, Camera, Plastic, to drive change by shifting societal norms. Sheila is focused on protecting the planet through a collective societal effort of individuals making slight changes to their lifestyles while pressuring lawmakers and large corporations simultaneously. Sheila believes that environmentalism is not an all or nothing effort. Rather, she believes that each time a habit of waste is broken, we become imperfect environmentalists. Lydia Dean Pilcher is a two-time Emmy-winning, Oscar-nominated producer of over 40 feature films and series uh, and founder of NYC production company Cinemosaic. Focusing on global culture and climate storytelling, her director credits include the, w, uh, the World War II spy thriller A Call to Spy and the climate narratives Radium Girls and science fiction film Homing Instinct. As co-founder and leader of the Producers Guild of America's PGA Green and Green Production Guide, uh, she has been an ambassador for sustainability and entertainment for over 15 years. She co-leads the WGA and PGA Interguild Climate Storytelling Initiative and co-chairs the Directors Guild of America Sustainable Features Committee. Uh, Laurel, Laurel Tamayo is the impact campaign, campaign consultant at Rare's Entertainment Lab, which brings behavioral insights to Hollywood, helping creators tell climate-friendly stories that put high-impact everyday behaviors on screen. She's also worked on impact campaigns for Down to Earth with Zac Efron season two and I Am Greta, inspiring the audience to take action on climate change. Prior to Rare, she worked on the Hollywood Climate Summit, Summit um, which is an annual gathering of the entertainment industry to address climate change and the Good Energy Playbook, uh, which is the guide for screenwriters on how they can weave climate change into their films and TV shows. She's currently in the Harvard Executive Education Program working on her public leadership certificate where she was awarded the Bacon Climate Leadership Scholarship. Uh, all right, thank you to all these amazing panelists for being here today. Uh, let's get started. So I think you can all put on your videos. Yeah, perfect. All right, um, so to start it off, uh, what is climate storytelling and what is the purpose of it? Uh, Lydia, why don't you start us off? Okay. It, um, I'm getting a message that the host has stopped my video. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> is anybody? There I am. No, there we go. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. What is climate storytelling and what is the purpose? That's the question, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, you laid out a lot of the sort of the how, when, and where, why we're, we're here. I mean, in general, most people in most countries accept that climate change is a reality. We, when we've gotten past that skepticism um, thing, <laughs> finally. And um, so people accept that it's a reality. They accept that it's caused by humans. They're concerned about it to some extent. But far less people think that there's anything that they can do about it. I mean, how many people do you know that say, I really care about this issue, but I, I don't, I, 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 I can't do anything. Well, what can I do? And for years, you know, we've talked about the power of our bully pulpit as filmmakers and um, the impact that we can have on audiences. So now that we've got this data and research that is saying, well, hey, maybe the reason 
people don't know what they can do is because there's not talking about it in film and television. The worlds that we're kind of like looking to for entertainment and for relief and modeling and inspiration, they aren't talking about climate. So there is a movement that's, you know, it's been sort of building and it's kind of taking off right now because uh, there's money from Europe being poured into this industry to really um, think about how we can normalize talking about climate on screen. And that means we're you know, encouraging writers and content creators to sort of can think about not just sort of what your big climate show is that you can come up with, but how can you incorporate it into all of your stories? How can you look at any show that you're writing or anything that you're thinking about writing and sort of think about the whole spectrum from you know, climate mentions, climate behaviors, um, you know, to putting it into dialogue, um, character jobs or subplots. Um, it's not, um, it doesn't have to be a climate show. Um, and then, you know, you can think about it in terms of any genre, storyline, feature, TV series, or TikTok, <laughs> which is happening quite a bit in the younger demographic. Um, so that's that's sort of where we are with climate storytelling. Um, there's, you know, we did a roll call in the industry um, a few weeks ago, and you know, over sixty organizations that are working in different levels of advocacy and research and um, content creation, content executives, financiers, um, scientists. I mean, it's a, it's really it was really an extraordinary group that came together. So I think it's really a serious conversation. It's on, and um, we're excited to bring everybody into this today and talk about it. Thank you, Lydia, that was great. Um, does anybody else wanna add to that? I think, I think that was really well explained. <laughs> um, okay, so then why, why do you believe climate concerns are so rarely mentioned or appearing in fictional TV? and film worlds, you know, you, you, you said how important it is. Why is it not showing up? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll direct this question to Carmel. Sure, yeah, I realized I was on mute. I was all excited <laughs> to jump in before. Uh, but um, yeah, off of what Lydia said, um, you really, we don't have to think of it as climate stories. We can think of it as climate portrayals, climate representation. Everyone is concerned, you know, is facing climate in some way in their lives. Um, but of course, we're not seeing it on screen, as Lydia pointed out. Um, so how can we approach that? And what, you know, you know, what are those roadblocks? Um, so a lot of conversations we've had with writers um, through our qualitative research and through that USC study you mentioned, um, one of the biggest writing blocks is that people are afraid that they're going to be boring or preachy and that they're gonna, that people are not interested, you know, in depressing stories. But climate does not have to be depressing. I mean, I know that might sound weird. Climate is so, so depressing. Um, but, um, you know, we, it doesn't have to be a lecture. You don't have to shoehorn information, right? And um, we're seeing such wonderful examples coming out. There's still far too few examples, but the ones that we are seeing are, uh, um, exciting you know it can be uh integrated into any genre into comedy um uh insecure is a great example El abbott elementary is a great example um weaving in um jokes um you know it's just part of our lives so how can we um represent that on screen as just part of our characters lives um yeah I can, I can go on, <laughs> but maybe I'll let others jump in. Hmm. Um, um, sorry, go on. Heather, you were gonna say something, no? I was just gonna say, Carmel, you've led such incredible work uh, through the playbook and the workshops that you're doing. One of the things that you say, and I would have highlighted is just this idea of like, if you're writing characters and stories, 
that aren't grappling with climate change, then you're sort of divorcing from our reality. And we're creating this portrayal of humanity and our stories that is not really reconciling with what we're experiencing emotionally. And I just think I really love that point that's raised. And to me, that's a, a highlight of climate storytelling is like, how are we seeing this in our own stories? Because it's a part of our story now, whether we like it or not, whether we control it or not, we're all coming at different entry points. And how are we seeing that in the various ways that we're reconciling with stories in our culture? And as Dorothy Shortberry, who says so brilliantly, you know, if climate isn't in your story, it's science fiction, right? It is just the climate is climate change is inner, inherently intersectional. You know, it intersects with all of our identities. It intersects with every issue that already exists that you're probably already working on a story about from migration to um, to food to um, to uh, you know living in a city to uh, any any topic you could think of climate can intersect um, so there's so many um, interesting and also entertaining ways that it could be woven in mm -hmm. yeah many people don't absorb um, information through facts so mm -hmm. storytelling is the way that they absorb information um, so yeah um, what are some challenges I, I know that we've spoken kind of about it but what are some other challenges or resistance to including climate narratives into scripts um, are, are there more challenges across certain genres um, certain formats um, Heather why don't you take this or sort us off. Sure, yeah. I mean, you know, I think for my listenings of the field from people who are trying to advance climate storytelling, I mean, some of the pushback that we're hearing and experiencing is I really think um, it's intimidating. Climate change is very intimidating to talk about. Uh, it's a huge problem. It feels like how do we see ourselves or our characters in this gigantic problem that we keep hearing more and more and more headlines about how is my story going to make a difference in this conversation so i think there's a big intimidation factor um, that is really playing a role here and so the more that we continue to have discourse about it and build up our kind of way of speaking about it in our own world and contextualization is really helpful to break down those barriers and i also think that there's um a real barrier to embracing the idea that there's a common set of values around how we care about our planet and how we care about our future. Um, oftentimes it can be misinterpreted that by putting climate in your narrative, you're attempting to be preachy or you're attempting to have a political message or you're trying to jam some sort of action plan down people's throats um, and storytellers don't necessarily want to do that with just the stories that they're telling. And so I think really understanding and leaning into uh, the humanity of what it's like to grapple with this, the complexity awareness of people being at different entry points, um, really expanding the idea of, um, as Carmiel said, avoiding the doom and gloom, conclusionary, fatalistic uh, conclusion of there's nothing we can do, there's no way I can help, there's nothing that my story will move the needle on, um, and just really kind of recontextualizing that by talking about this issue is like talking about every other issue that we care about, it intersects with it, um, we are humans in the story of it. Let's break it down to the micro. Let's talk about the ways that it is really affecting our emotions as people, our interpersonal dynamics. Let's not look at solutions just as science-based solutions, but as people, communities, discussion, um, and rising to meet challenges. And let's talk about that as a climate story instead of feeling like we have to offer like a textbook explanation or an action plan that makes you feel like you are stepping into a zone that you don't yet feel comfortable doing. Mm -hmm. I, I also think building on everything that you just said, Heather, that um, engaging you know, on climate change is challenging because it's filled with so many uncertainties and um, it just, it's its almost existential, you know, sometimes it just feels bigger than us, right? So um, we, in that sense, I think, you know, we're living in a time when 
people are managing anxiety by with a certain amount of denial because it's just necessary to kind of keep keep it all together. We're just dealing with so much um, disruption in our lives. And um, there was this article in the Washington Post this week about hope. And it was so interesting the way they talked about hope because they were they were saying it's more like a muscle than an emotion. Like it's a like it's a cognitive skill. I thought, oh my God, hope is a cognitive skill. I just thought I had to take my meds. Um, <laughs> but one that helps people reject the status quo and visualize a better way, that you're act that you actually have a role to play in making it better. So in that sense, activism, joining with other people, working on this issue is a way to mitigate that kind of anxiety that we're inevitably going to feel because we are, you know, things are going to get better, but they're also going to get worse. And we're going to be in this kind of messy middle for a while. And it's going to be, um, it's going to be stressful. So I think all of those things are things that as storytellers, we can help people navigate, you know, and we can, by creating, you know, complex characters that we can identify with on screen. And, and when you're writing stories, you want to think about the world building of your story and how many people you represent on your screen that you can enter the story through because that means you're going to increase your audience by that many people. So I think, you know, insights um, to what people are feeling and, you know, helping people guide people toward the ways that they can find solutions is something that we can do, um, you know, to sort of bring resilience, you know, to our culture. And um, it's something that we're just going to increasingly need as, as, you know, as we enter this next wave. I love this discussion of emotions and hope, um, and especially like in the activist community, it's, it's really not a question of hope versus hopelessness, right? It, climate change covers the entire human emotional spectrum, um, just like our stories can, you know? So you know, again, like these stories do not have to be depressing, you know, it's climate change, as it gets worse, even we're still going to fall in love and there's going to be babies. And there's just like life events will happen in conjunction as climate touches every part of our lives. Um, so I think that there's still, you know, joy to be had even when shit hits the fan, you know, and, and there's still joy that can be part of our stories. And um, yeah, I think, I think that um, as storytellers, you know, we don't need to be afraid of um uh of the doom and gloom like heather was saying that we can um look to uh these real life activists and um some of whom are on this panel uh to to see um just how wide ranging these stories could be mm -hmm. um so that kind of leads me into how we want more storytellers or people to, to write stories, but um, how can we ensure writers and creators have the best resources upon which to relay accurate information on climate? And that actually lends into a question that we just had from the, the, uh, one of our guests, Pam, who is kind of asking the same thing, um, how we're ensuring that the way that we're, that we're representing climate change is factual, but also not doom and gloom. Um, Laurel. Yeah, well, so I work at Rare and it's a behavior change organization. And we spent years of research doing, um, trying to find the behaviors at the intersection of high potential for adoption and carbon emission reduction. And so those things were eating a plant-based diet, reducing food waste, driving an electric vehicle, and also what best predicts whether people will actually take action isn't climate concern, it isn't political orientation, it's actually whether they think the people around them are already taking action on climate change. And so we really focus on trying to normalize these behaviors and there are so many different ways to do that. Um, going off of what Lydia and Carmiel already said, it can be like really small things, like maybe it's people having a conversation while they're plugging in their electric vehicle, like in Netflix's partner track or um, in Next in Fashion season two, which is a competition show. There are moments where they upcycle clothes, um, but you can also have bigger plot lines like in HBO's Sex Lives of College Girls, they had 
a strip show fundraiser for climate change and they bring in like a climate refugee to convince the president to let them do it and in those shows sustainability was brought in very smoothly and it wasn't jarring to viewers and so there are so many different ways to integrate climate Sheila you're muted yeah. I was just going to say um, one more thing to add to that. Uh, by the way, hi, everyone. I'm Sheila with Habits of Waste. Um, we had a conversation once with a director and trying to get them to adopt our campaign, which is lights, camera, plastic to remove plastic on screen. And, you know, they're like, well, we have a scene that's a, a fair and it's really difficult to not have those classic, you know, one single use items that are in a fair. However, um, what we can do is have one of the characters who's supposed to be an immigrant from another country come in uh, and comment on the overflowing trash bins that are in the, in the you know, normal fair scene. So just like we were talking about before, where it would kind of do us a disservice to not mention anything about you know climate and issues like this because it is a reality so they modified the the script to reflect this person's shock for how much trash there is in this country and do you guys throw everything away kind of thing so it it i i would love to know you know i would love to note that we're not looking for writers to be experts in this arena however it's very um doable, I think, to reflect what we see in the world um, as it is currently and show the concern about it and perhaps show better ways. Um, yeah, so I wanted to share that little tidbit that I thought was really interesting. Yeah, and it, just to um, second that point that you do not have to be a climate expert to write about climate. Like climate is already a part of your life, so you're already an expert in some way and starting where you're interested in is the best way. And um, there are many, many experts out there who want to help. And uh, so there's many organizations, including Good Energy, that um, consult on projects and put um, projects and studios and writers in touch with super appropriate experts, you know, anywhere from like researching arsenic dust as a byproduct of the drought in Salt Lake City to, you know, um, to climate migration. Um, so whatever the topic is, there are experts who want to help because they want to see more stories like this. And then of course, um, the playbook, I'd, I'd love to drop in the chat and I know Lydia just dropped other resources as well. So there's many, many resources and many people who want to help and who have lived experience too from the front lines who are also experts for those stories. Yeah, and um, I'll add, I mean, Carmiel's um, group with Anna Jane Joyner, um, the Good Energy um, Project and Playbook is, is one of the um, big climate training groups. And there's another one, um, Natural Resources Defense Council in RDC has a program called Rewrite the Future. And both these two groups are very active in the entertainment industry, doing trainings um, with different, um, you know, writers rooms and corporations and creative execs and um it's it's really helpful um i know carmiel's going to keep talking about good energy today because there's so much work they're doing um but i also want to mention that nrdc has 700 experts that they're working with it's um it's an organization that is in you know they do quite a bit of litigation actually but the rewrite the future program is a is a part of it which is about um affect impacting change through storytelling. And um, they're, they're really, you know, they're really terrific because, you know, and we've worked with them on some of our PGA, WGA climate storytelling with writers and creative producers and showrunners um, who, by the way, you know, we were introducing this idea of the spectrum of climate storytelling that seemed like for the first time, uh, it's, it's a new way of thinking about climate storytelling. And it's important given this data. But also, I, I, sometimes I'm struck by the fact that, you know how um, lawyers have to go sort of do education around upping their, um, their credentials and their credibility to keep their license. And um, so they're going to this convention or this seminar just to get updated on the latest. I mean, we are so in that place with climate because the science, um, which we mentioned is intimidating, doesn't have to be we can all you know we can all learn it and as storytellers we can also translate it um and we can work with consultants you know um we know that 
two studios have sustainability departments where executives have content in their title, and that's Netflix and NBC Universal. And they're working with people to, um, they'll bring in these consultants to work with writers um, and storytellers to help um, to help suss out, you know, somebody asked the question about how do you know it's factual? Well, you bring in resources who specialize, you know, in whatever the particular area that you're working in, and they will they will help you do that work. And then you as the artist and the storyteller have to decide how to make that understandable. But I think people are hungry for this because in that vein of, I care about this, but I don't know what to do. We need to be educated. I'm, you know, we do a lot of work around clean energy on the on the su sustainable production side, and I'm always shocked how overwhelmed people are about the concept of clean energy, and frankly, just don't quite understand sort of the full spectrum that's happening right now, and it's happening very rapidly. So these are um, important things that we all need to know to sort of talk about how we decarbonize our world. But um, I think that's exciting. You know, I think it's exciting to get into that. You don't have to pick a story that would take you in that direction. But I think that as we, um, you know, as we move deeper and deeper into seeing more content on screen, people will become more hungry for knowledge that helps them understand the things that are just happening right around you right now and the choices that you can make. Uh, and if I could add one more thing, you know, when you're thinking about being factually accurate um i would invite you to also think about what's your role as an anthropologist as a storyteller and not just look at like what are the facts behind what i need to present as data but what are the cultural norms that have gotten us here what are the systems at play that people feel stuck in um and don't see a way out of and how are different people experiencing this and coming to the conclusions that they're coming to and really looking at maybe less as a factual presentation as a representation as an authentic representation of how are we here and what has led us to get here and how do we you know dissect some of those cultural norms and systems that perpetuate that um because that is where the character work can get really deep and that is where the story backdrops can be really interesting um and you can feel that can guide you to where you need to be factually accurate but you know i think authentic portrayal of people and complexity awareness of where we're at is another deep important thing to think about when we're thinking about accurately portraying things. Such great answers. Thank you. Um, you've all just shared amazing resources. Uh, so thank you for that. And that kind of led me into another question of mine. Um, is So the resources available to writers, <laughs> um, you've already shared uh, many there. But to your knowledge, is climate storytelling addressed in any screenwriting courses by aspiring filmmakers? Are there any resources for them for aspiring filmmakers or for aspiring writers? Um, Carmel, wanna start well, well, I guess I'll plug our workshop. Um, I mean, we <laughs> love uh, uh, we call it the Climate Lens Workshop. So we really do. Um, come at this from an angle of climate representation or portrayal that can be integrated into like raising the climate lens as a generative tool for any story in any genre. Um, you know, something that can make characters more complex and and uh, or or make add conflict or deepen a setting. Um, and uh, as Lydia mentioned, NRDC also has workshops and trainings. Um, and I'm sure others on this panel know of, of other workshops and trainings as well. Hmm. Um, amazing, thank you. Um, at the end of the panel, I do have a list of resources available to everyone. Um, so they'll, they'll, you'll all be able to see a list um, of grants, fellowships, and resources available to you all as well. Um, just plug so, there's the green uh, film schools initiative so if there are any students out there get in touch with them um i think that 
they're building resources for schools and educators specifically. So we just want to make sure that you know about that group and encourage your school to join uh, the Green Film Schools Initiative if that is something that's of interest to uh, bringing if it isn't at your school right now. Yeah, I, I called them um, actually in our from our prep meeting um, to see how many and how many schools had the uh, had any kind of co climate content in their um, screenwriting courses, and they um, they they knew of a few sort of anecdotally, but then they were going to sort of I think reach out and sort of take a survey of the group. I also think we might have actually created a little impact by sparking the question because we. <laughs> Because whenever you ask, you know, do you have this, then somebody's, the next question is, well, why not? You know, <laughs> how great or why not? Um, so um, it'll be interesting to see um, if there's an uptick in that next year. And I think, yeah, Tish and um, Columbia are starting to integrate that into their screenwriting classes for sure. And AFI, right, we heard. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> a new generation of writers. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, Sheila, before you mentioned many um, ways of adding products onto the actual screen or, or items to the actual screen in, in that way, what are some resources, um, what are some resources these decision makers um, can use to find vetted green products? Um, like for example, green product placement. Um, and what are some of those barriers? Um, thank you. Yeah, I think that any scene that we talk about here with our Lights, Camera, Plastic campaign can most of the time be told with a reusable product instead. So sometimes it's as simple as swapping a plastic water bottle in like a conference room scene for a pitcher of water and glasses. So it doesn't necessarily need to have like a big um, kind of search for these products. However, there are films um, like Marry Me Film that did a, a huge partnership with Swell where they had um, Jennifer Lopez's character have a reusable water bottle that had Swarovski crystals all around it. And it really was in line with who her character was and she was this big star in the film and everything. And so every single time she had a water bottle, it was all crystal. So I think that there are ways to get creative. And of course, Swell became, um, you know, a, a huge element of the film and, and product placement was a part of it. So just like um, a lot of times people tell us, oh, well, is, is, you know, lights, camera, plastic, what about, is it really going to work? Does it really matter? We talk a lot about product placement and how if it didn't work, um, what you put on screen, if it didn't really matter, there would be no products out there spending millions of dollars to be in front of us. So I think um, it's really crucial to, to look at it like that and understand that, A, there are sustainable companies out there who would really do uh, whatever it takes to get in front of viewers. And B, many times, um, instead of a plastic cutlery, you just use a stainless steel one. And that usually doesn't impact the production's budget or anything like that, uh, because it's it's what's around and it's reusable. So um, yeah, I hope that, that that answers the question um, really clearly, because I think when we say to swap out the plastic items for reusables, we're really not looking for a, a massive lift. We're looking for what's the simplest, easiest, most realistic uh, alternative that's you know good for the planet so that we can inspire people just like we did with smoking many years back by removing smoking from screens, we were able to see a huge dip in actual smokers. So what we're trying to do is denormalize single use plastic as the default and start to give people some um, other options to look at while they're, while they're watching their films. And subconsciously we believe that they will start to notice um, that they're gonna reach for reusable first, hopefully rather than the single use. <laughs> Great. Um, who are the decision makers when it comes to including more sustainable products on screen? Um, and like, what are the some of the first steps when analyzing how to include more sustainable actions and products or or storylines in the scripts? Well, with, with our with our research, um, we automatically assumed it was a set decorator or the prop master, and we interviewed a few of them and started to realize that they didn't wanna make the decision to put the reusables on screen because they were afraid for their job. They were afraid the director would come in and say, well, why?" I never said to make a green set. 
And so they were filled with worry. And so what we did was we went in and created a toolkit so that any production can basically create a new culture within the walls of their production by getting the executive producer or the director to first start with um, an email, just explaining what the issues are with single use plastic and how this production is going to try and be uh, plastic free as often as possible on screen. That then translates into providing, you know, watermarks on the scripts, posters, um, again, to neutralize that this is not going to get you into trouble. So everyone knows, everyone is seeing clearly that there is um, a request made by the higher ups to go reusable wherever possible. And that's exactly what the signage says. Um, we spoke to many groups and they suggested that at the very beginning of the production, there's usually a HR meeting. And during that HR meeting, some directors have been using the opportunity to set the tone for this issue of uh, not using plastic on screen. Hmm. That's interesting. Very interesting. Um, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, okay. We often think about climate storytelling as documentaries about the natural world how the forests and animals are disappearing, sometimes very doom and gloom. Um, how can we make climate more relatable to our everyday lives and be part of all genres? And now I know that we spoke about um, just making it simple decisions, but does anybody have anything else to add to that? Uh, Laurel, do you wanna? Honestly, I feel like I've said everything <laughs> earlier. Lydia, do you have something that you wanted to add? Well, yeah. Um... Well, actually, I wanted to, because Miranda had a good question um, in the chat, and I, I wanted to, and it, it's kind of spinning into this a, a little bit, um, but she said, um, she, she was talking about, let me go back to it, um, how can those who are knowledgeable about climate change and want to get involved in climate storytelling process um, do it despite not being traditional writers? And I, I think one of the things that's interesting is that, um, you know, we're learning a lot more about the younger audience, like, you know, in, in 16 to 25, that, that people are not watching, that, that, that group is not watching television um, in the way that older generations have, and that they're more apt to get their climate content through social influencers and on, you know, YouTube and TikTok. And I find that really um, important information. Um, because I think that, you know, we have in, in this sort of, um, you know, my kids are digital, I call them digital natives, because they've only known digital um, content and, and, and t attention spans are different. And we take in content in different ways. And I think that, you know, it's important to broaden that conversation about points of entries. The other thing I'll say is, you know, you may be a writer and you can pursue that and that's a there's a lot of ways to to do that but you know content also gets produced it gets directed it gets acted it could you know it, it happens on so many levels and it, it's a big collaborative process so if you're interested in storytelling as a career I would really that's it's a whole nother spectrum to look at in terms of points of entry and ways that you can be a creative um, and a creative collaborator and something that you're passionate about um, now I forgot what your the other question was that you asked. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think it was it was very well answered. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think I'd it's, love to it's, just it's, yeah. <laughs> I'd love to add, uh, Analore, because you mentioned documentaries as sort of being in the front of our minds, oh, yeah. the nature animal ecosystem forward stories, and would love to share that. Um, actually where I find some of the most incredible climate storytelling that does humanize the climate crisis is in documentary filmmaking. And I really encourage you to check out films like The Territory, Youth v. Gov, uh, Impossible Town, um, Sea of Shadows. Like there's a whole list of um, real stories of real people and uh, how they are grappling with climate change in their community, in their personal life, and have taken it upon themselves 
to become the hero of their own story. And that's told through a story and it's very powerful. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, one of the, our roles at the Redford Center is to really expand the definition of what we think of as an environmental story, because we do have an image that comes to mind when we say environmental story. And actively, I think that's what's harming some of the fiction work that's happening is because we have this idea of what environmental storytelling means. Um, and I think we need to see more people in those stories. I think we need to see more um, cultures in those stories. And I think um, leaning into even short form stories, look on New York op docs, look on um, many environmental filmmaking uh, film festivals. We're seeing short films come through that you can really tap in really quickly to some very humanized experiences. Um, and it's really, really incredibly inspiring firsthand accounts of lived experience of climate change. Yeah. I, just to jump in on that, I, I mean, Heather wrote a great piece for the playbook also about um, documentaries as, as inspiration too for uh, fiction writers. Um, which is, you know, where my brain goes, like, ooh, that's that's perfect <laughs> inspiration um, and IP. And um, and as far as other genres go, um, any uh, climate change is ripe for detective genres. You know, uh, it's it's a big problem that needs solving. So why not enter it into these problem solving kind of genres? Or imagine, um, you know, procedurals and cop shows where bodies surface after mudslides or, you know, there's all sorts of fun ways um, in any genre that it could show up. Um, How to Blow Up a Pipeline is a new film that's about to be released. It's a heist genre about climate activists. It's it's incredible. Um, so yeah, any genre, <laughs> I think climate fits. Mm. I was, yeah. um, Heather, you should talk about the Hollywood Climate Summit too, but um, I'll just say that last year, the Hollywood Climate Summit, I was part of the pitch fest and I was taking pitches and it was really interesting to see what people were write, what people were writing about in, in climate content. And I was really struck by um, the number of stories that were about people who had been impacted by climate, you know, and with the wildfires, with health issues, with hurricanes, with, you know, when we're talking about, you know, loss of home, we're talking about, you know, all of a sudden having to find a new way. It's, um, this is, you know, I, I was struck last, you know, when, when Biden sort of made the comment that he, that we never anticipated the amount of climate refugees that we're going to have in America because of rising sea level and wildfires and droughts and everything that's happening. And that kind of, you know, I think those stories, they, they really touched me. And, you know, I think if we can start touching people now before it gets worse, then we, you know, then we could get more people leaning in into, into being proactive. But I think that um, we all know that, you know, when we go to pitch stories, you know, to financiers, they want to know the human story. You know, they want to know who who's who the main characters are, what are they feeling, what is what are you know what are they confronting, what decisions do they need to make as characters, and and then the climate is there as part of the cultural background or the physical background, and 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 yet we're following you know characters that we identify with, and that's where we always have the most impact as as storytellers. Um. Mm -hmm. Going back to what Heather said about, um, you know, people having an idea of what an environmental film is, I was recently speaking to a, a screenwriter and I mentioned the good energy statistic about how only 2.8% of scripts had any climate keywords. And they were like, well, only a certain percent of um, scripts are sci-fi to begin with. And I was like, well, it doesn't have to just be in sci-fi. It can be in so many other things. It could be in rom-coms. It could be in cooking shows. And so I think that's definitely a challenge that I see um, is just kind of like breaking that idea that it's only documentaries. Mm -hmm. Would love to see a climate rom-com. <laughs> um, I wanted to just add that I think sometimes when we talk to people out there about climate storytelling, they automatically assume that we're saying to create a film like Don't Look Up, um, which 
was like the you know ultimate climate storytelling film, right? But um, we we can just like take about twenty steps back, I think, because so many people out there really ha have no idea that you know this is not normal to, for example, like I said earlier, have an overflowing trash every ten feet. Um, just just showing that there is a concern there, I think. Of offers just a, a smidge of an opening in someone's mindset that says, oh, is this not normal already? Like I live in an area that this is normal, but if it's not normal for someone else, maybe I can do better. So that that for, for me here at Habits of Waste is my mission. It's like, but we, we try so hard to, to take it down a couple notches because the first thing someone says is either it's a documentary or a film like Don't Look Up. And it just doesn't have to be. So that is one thing that I think we have to clarify a little bit more for the industry so that people aren't so intimidated by the idea. Yeah, it can be as simple as um, a climate action, you know, in one scene, uh, even just showing solar panels to actually showing the adoption of uh, based off of Rare's work, you know, showing a character actually adopting that behavior um, is incredibly impactful. So, but any of that is helpful at this point. Yeah, and also including like lived realities from around the globe, like not just certain um, certain areas of the world, um, engaging storytellers from all nations uh, to get those different perspectives. Um, I love it. Thank you so much for all the answers. Um, are there some genres that are more difficult to interweave climate into than others? Um, like, for example, period pieces. Um, and what are some creative ways to weave sustainable storytelling into these, uh, into them? Uh, anybody can take it. Farmil, do you want to start? Oh, um, I mean, again, just uh, in from anything can be in the back. Well, period pieces, I would, I mean, that's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, I would say, uh, um, uh, starting from, uh, you know, when we actually started talking about climate change um, is is where we look at it to in, into the near future. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think it's possible in any genre, as long as you're starting from character, especially. So what would your character do? Um, how would your character authentically um, uh, encounter the climate crisis? Um, how would they avoid it or deny it? How would they, how does their response differ from, you know, another character's response in the same scene? Um, so starting from character, no matter what genre, I think um, is often key. I've also given that thought because you sent that question to think about uh, Anna Laura and I was thinking about period pieces because I thought that was a really interesting point. And I was thinking, can you show the change that has happened to our natural world through traveling through time? Can you show what extractive practices have put people, society, and environments through? Um, can you grapple with um, people making decisions and why they made decisions to perpetuate those systems at the time that they were living and how did we get here? Um, there's a lot of root cause symptoms of climate change to examine in period pieces that I think are really interesting. So, you know, I think it's, it's, like Lydia said, I think it's exciting to be presented with these challenges because I think there is a way in through nearly every application that I've heard about. It's just about digging into um, what do you want to say and where did, how did we get here and what is, what is the human journey to be where we are now and what decisions can we make differently that are different than those that we made in the past. Hmm. Wow. That's, that's really, I love that, like bringing it in um, how we got here. Yeah. I think I think content that shows political will is important too. And I I you know we I made a film um, called Radium Girls about the Radium Girls and that was in the 1920s and it was the dawn of industrialization. But we found that you know and this was really tough because these girls were you know painting glow in the dark watch dial um, watch dials it for the soldiers and 
They were, um, radium had just been invented by Marie Curie and everybody thought it was the miracle elixir of all times. And, and it was doing some good things like x-rays and, but it was also, these girls were um, imbibing it and dying and the corporate doctors were diagnosing them with syphilis and nobody was really, you know, understanding what was happening. And then, and they were, a lot of them were teenagers in New Jersey. And so they wrote, they, they decided when they realized that, that this is what was happening. They made a decision to stand up to the corporation. And um, that became sort of the hope <laughs> of the story. Cause I was like, How, oh my God, we're making this story about these girls, they're just gonna die, which they did, they all died. But they actually impacted history in a way that they'll never know, but we know. And you know, when we screened the movie at Tribeca, I invited Betsy Sutherland from the EPA to stand on the stage. Cause I didn't wanna talk about how much it cost and this and that I wanted, Betsy to talk about, she had told me that the EPA still uses the radium girls case because it turned out to be the playbook for big tobacco. And, and so this, you know, corporate, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we really have to deal with because, you know, we're, we're dealing with other things in our industry around climate right now, where we know that fossil fuel companies have created the personal calculator to deflect responsibility onto the individual away from their responsibility, which is, you know, massive. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things about, you know, that kind of bobbing and weaving, but I think anything that can kind of help build, um, you know, confidence in people to know that their voice matters, that, you know, that you can make a difference and that it's really up to us and we need to find like-minded allies and join together and figure out what we can do together, because that's really how, things will change. Yeah. Thank you for all that. That was, that was mm -hmm. great. Uh, Jen, you have a question. Yes. Hi. Thanks, everyone. This is really amazing. This is Jennifer Sandoval from Earth Angel. And um, I just had a comment about something that Heather mentioned, because I think about that period piece and how, you know, how can stories be woven in, but that's how, you know, that's how I've thought about it is you know, showing how we got here. And I just like, I watched the Fablemans. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's brilliant. The other day and the character, the mother, um, <clears throat> they, every time they had dinner, like every dinner, they would use throw away like plates and cups and, and, and even, you know, the tablecloth was plastic and she would just wrap it up and throw it in the garbage <laughs> after every meal. And it was like that feeling of kind of like shock to see something like that. I think you know, um, because it was from the, I guess in the fifties, you know, we can, you know, I think there was a lot more, you know, that was a lot more normal to just like use plastic for everything. Um, so, but just having that reaction was something that I thought about like, wow, that, that actually is, you know, meaningful because I'm having a reaction to this because it's really bothering me. Yeah. That, that reminds me of that Mad Men scene where they just throw yeah. out of the car window, which is just, was yeah. such reminder of, okay, we've come this far, maybe change is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they all go for a picnic and they just leave everything okay. and the garbage in the park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, amazing. Um, I know you all brought up different shows to watch um, and different um, things, but what are you currently watching? What are you currently watching that has climate storytelling? Um, what do you recommend is on top of mind. Uh, anybody can answer. I'm watching um, Ted Lasso season three with my kids right now. And um, actually last night they had a scene where they were having lunch with a plastic bowl and a plastic fork. And I, I thought they were doing so good, but oh, I yeah. don't know why that <laughs> popped in there. So I was bummed a little bit, but it's a good show. Well, <laughs> season one, they drank out of red plastic cups on the field. And then season two, they were drinking out of reusable bottles. I noticed that change so distinctly because I was angry at the <laughs> yeah. first. That's some of your work in there, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. That's great. I, I would really just to drive home, you know, go see how to blow up a pipeline. Uh, and um, uh, I, I really love how El Abbott Elementary is weaving it into several episodes through jokes, through, um, you know, it used, the environmentalist used to be the butt of the joke. Now, you know, we're on the side of the environmentalist and the butt of the joke is the mean principal who's making fun of him, you know? So, uh, so we're flipping that script a bit. Um, 
Uh, yeah, any comedy that that integrates it. Succession has, you know, kind of several beats of climate change as we follow the bad guys. Um, how how news um, how their their organization perpetuates lies, and so um, it's part of their their story world, really, pretty subtly, but uh, but beautifully. So, yeah. Um. I'm having a very interesting relationship with extrapolations um, mm -hmm. on Apple, which is um, dropping and I think maybe just has another episode or so to go. But um, it's, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's a series about um, climate that sort of skips decades into the future. And so it's very... Um, you know, but but what's interesting to me, and I think it's interesting for all of us who are interested in climate storytelling, because it's an anthology, even though there, there are some threads that carry through, but it's an anthology and there are different, you know, different scripts, different directing styles, different um, arcs, different topics and subject matter. And, it, and you know, it, I, I, I can imagine it's, you know, everything's not going to resonate for everybody, but somebody's going to find something in there. And it really does sort of lay out this kind of foundation for like what we can sort of think about in terms of the kind of climate stories we want to tell and what, what, you know, it's a, it's a large body of work where you can kind of go in and um, this, this worked, why did that work, whatever. And um, I was particularly taken by the episode about the fifth question as we um, enter the Passover season here and um, the re this relationship between um, this young girl in Miami that's going underwater, the temple is, you know, everybody's <laughs> wearing their rubber boots to temple. And uh, David Diggs plays the rabbi and she's having her bat mitzvah and she really um, just sort of lets every, she, you know, her question at the beginning is why is God doing this to us? You know, if he cares us, about us, if he loves us, why is he doing this, doing this to us? And that kind of question kind of goes over and you're, it makes you think about, you know, how we find um, spiritual strength and how people relate to religion in terms of these questions and seeking answers. And um, toward the end of it, um, uh, and I know this stuck with me because my husband said, are you talking about that episode again? You know, like I kept saying, and do you remember that? Um, but um, toward the end of it, I was very interested um, and I was kind of writing down notes. Sometimes I write notes because I want to like to study the dialogue or go back and look at it. And there were some very, very sort of interesting things. And I thought I heard something. And I thought I heard them say, what does it mean to be human? And I wanted to go back and find that place. And I watched the scene over and over. I cannot fucking find that line. And I realized that I wrote it myself. Like I must have just written it while I was watching it. What does it mean to be human? And it was so, it, it, and that's what I took away from the scene and their dialogue and and sort of the world that we're in. And it was very it was very powerful for me. So. Um, yeah, so I, I haven't made it through the whole series yet, but I'm kind of excited to see what else might kind of um, <laughs> set my mind on fire. <laughs> yeah. uh, many people in the chat have also um, added shows that they're watching uh, Unstable. We have Dark Waters. Um, someone else brought up the, the Elephant Whispers. Mm. Um, so that's really great. Plug in all your, your shows into the chat. Um, and unless somebody else wants to add another show, I do have a question from uh, from one of our guests. I'll second the chat um, and say Unstable is a great show. Um, it's about this biotech company that's working on creating carbon sequestering concrete, but the show is a comedy about like this father-son relationship. And so they just do a really great job of like integrating a lot of jokes and keeping it lighthearted. Yeah, I think I'll add fiction. I've really enjoyed Succession and how they sort of skim around climate change. And um, The Politician on Netflix has some really interesting intergenerational dialogue that occurs. And if you're looking for documentaries to watch, can't recommend highly enough the territory which grapples with indigenous land protectors and King Cole, which talks about uh, communities in Appalachia adjusting to the end of the coal era. So some really, really cool narratives to check out there if you want some documentary inspiration. Perfect. Thank you so much.
Uh, okay, so we have a question from one of our guests, uh, Simran Manga. Do you think that audiences are mature enough to welcome characters following sustainable practices on screen while the actors of those characters may not be doing so in reality? Would that create a sort of dissonance and lack of authenticity? I, I get that question a lot actually, but go ahead, Carmel, I'll go after you. Uh, just that we're all climate hypocrites to some extent or another. In Hollywood, maybe more so, uh, but um, but I love that we're all talking about showing sustainability on screen and want to add that it isn't, to solve this crisis isn't about changing our personal behaviors only, it is about solving these systemic issues and going after the few people who are truly causing this, the fossil fuel industry. So. Um, so as long as we're, um, I, I, I wouldn't let people off the hook that easily, Carmel. I just, <laughs> when you say we're all climate hypocrites, I think, I think that means like, there's no way we can all be net zero all the time where there's something that we're not going to get there on, but it doesn't mean that we can't do our best at everything that is possible. And I, I, I say, you know, I say, if that's happening, a little shame goes a long way. <laughs> So I, I try not to shame or blame personally within my you know network of people, but what I do get a lot of is, well, if we're using plastic behind the scenes at a, on set, and then we're not putting it on screen, are we being hypocrites? Is this right? You know, I feel bad. And my theory is that when you start to create these new norms by setting up a scene, you know, where there's 6 billion people in the world watching film and television, I think eventually if we start with what's on screen, it will circle back to what's behind the scenes. So we have to start somewhere. And I do believe very, very wholeheartedly that um, it is it is the, the best possible platform to use film and television to create those new mindsets and those new, um, you know, just creating new, new, new normals throughout society of people who may not have ever even looked at it. So whether they're being a hypocrite or not, I think is kind of moot. So instead, let's do our best with, with what's on screen, because it is a reality that we can create, and then use that with momentum to build a new social um, understanding throughout society. And then you'll see very soon that it will be completely, um, different behind the scenes, because then that's when the shame comes in. That's when it's like, Ooh, I feel bad using this plastic thing Be or I feel bad, you know, whatever, driving this car because my favorite celebrities all the time on TV now are driving electric vehicles. And then that's when it's the hidden hand theory that we're all kind of like, who's watching me behave this way. I don't want to be that person. And I'll also add one more weird thing. That's kind of interesting. It's if you go into a Starbucks or one of these coffee shops and they, they did a study where they said, okay, uh, you'll get 25 cents if you bring your own cup. That did less of an, of an impact on behavior change than the, the person who was standing in line watching three other people holding their reusable cup. So um, as human beings, that is what, what makes us change is watching and learning from others that, you know, maybe we look up to, maybe they're our peers, maybe they're our social, our friends in our society. Same thing with um, solar panels. Like when they see the neighborhood is getting them, then everyone starts to realize, okay, I got to get them too. And that's why I think film and TV is such a great opportunity. So I think the hypocrisy of it all is kind of, um, let's, I believe we should just kind of put that to the side for a minute, do our best on screen and let uh, societal shifts take their course. I'd also like to add that I really love this question because it highlights the importance of culture. And the culture that I want to talk about is the culture of Hollywood. And I think what we're seeing right now is still a resistance. It's so sad. Some of the stories that have been shared today, people feeling that they were going to get in trouble for recommending a reusable prop on set and things like that. That's, you know, I think it's worth us recognizing. And this is why I'm a co-founder of the Hollywood Climate Summit. We have some community organizing to do in our own industry. We are not there yet. The fact that we still feel these barriers as industry professionals uh, in our own industry to do this advocacy work and to not have it be taboo and to not have it feel like we're going to be in trouble, um, that's a deep reflection of where we are 
in our culture in Hollywood and we need to make it accessible and cool and fun and these actors need to come along with us on that journey our directors and showrunners need to come along with us on that journey we need to drive that cultural shift and that is greatly in part due to us convening gathering putting some support behind this and not staying in siloed spaces where we're only individually advocating in our own little worlds and so join the hollywood climate summit come out see the movement happening um there's community organizing that needs to happen in this industry for any of these things to ever ever really not be facing these barriers that we've talked about today mm -hmm. such passion i love it yeah thousand percent yeah <laughs> uh, we need this passion we need people standing up for for this change um yeah Dimitri you go Heather <laughs> um it's perfect um I I don't see any other questions in the chat uh I think everybody's just been sharing resources and um shows that they're watching which is great um so I really want to thank you. I want to thank you all, everyone, for joining us today. Um, uh, it's taking time out of your day to join us um, and to listen to all the in insights that came out today. Um, but a, a special thank you to all of our wonderful panelists today. Um, and a huge shout out goes to MOM um, and the NYC Film Green Program for helping to facilitate this amazing panel and the various office hour panels that we do. Um, on that note, please join us for the next Office Hours panel on sustainable food on set. Um, and this one will be on May 23rd. Um, but I really do want to thank everybody for coming in. Um, uh, and yeah, thank you to the, the panelists. Here are some resources on the screen that you can access for um, resources on, uh, on climate storytelling, on how to integrate it into your scripts, um, various toolkits, um, various other tools that you can use, along with some fellowships and grants. Um, if you're looking for funding for your project, um, there's uh, currently a, 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 con a contest going on um, for climate scripts. I don't remember who it was hosted by, um, but uh, definitely. There's the, so there's the Hollywood Climate Summit Pitch Fest, which is open it, right that's now. That's what it was. So please apply for that and the Climate Storytelling Fellowship in collaboration with the Blacklist, the Redford Center, CAA Foundation, and the NRDC uh, is also coming up soon in April. So a couple of opportunities if you are writers. Sorry, just wanted to make sure that people knew. No, please, please. Um, I forgot that that was, that, that was who was hosting the contest. But yes, perfect. Um, and also as a reminder, this, this panel has been recorded um, and it will be posted to the NYC Film Green uh, web page uh, as, a, as a little video. Um, so you can definitely rewatch it, re listen again to all of the insights that have been shared here today. Um, and uh, I'll try to share all of these amazing resources that just keep getting shared with the chat um, to all of the panel or uh, to all the guests that, that came here today. Uh, let me check the, ch the channel, see if there's any other questions. Uh, a reminder to apply to Pitch Fest before April 27th. Uh, we want climate scripts, bring them in. Um, but yes, thank you all. Thank you so much for joining. And that concludes our panel. Thank you, panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank oh, you. and yes, if, if you do want more resources, look to the um, NYC uh, Film Green website, um, but also uh, to the Earth Angel website um, to find out on new panels or upcoming more resources of the like. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>